So today we're doing something fun, time-lapsed photography and video. We're going to show this comb honey here, and it's put out at a feeding station. And I'll tell you why I'm doing this in a few minutes. But the bees did not waste any time in locating it. This is natural foundationless comb. So every part of this is made by bees, and the honey that's in it is stored by bees, and it's capped by bees. And we're in a semi-dearth right now because of the recent rains and cold weather. And what you're looking at here took place over a period of several hours. So it's got me thinking, how long does it take honeybees, wasps, flies, and everything else to rob out a honeybee colony? Does it really happen as fast as we're thinking that it should? In other words, when you come by your beehive and you see the bees are robbing it, how long would it take the robbers to actually reduce their resources enough to jeopardize the colony of bees? So I'm going to show you that uh, here in a second time-lapse sequence because during this one, my battery ran down. So I'm going to do it again. And here we go. Now we're putting out more comb honey. This represents about a third of a full deep standard frame. Now, given that the bees have full access to it and they go shoulder to shoulder on it, they are consuming the honey and carrying it back to the colony with their honey crop and they have to unload it there, pass it on to another bee inside the hive and then come back and get more. And of course, they bring their sisters with them and they start uh, at the edges and they clean out every single cell here. Other things were going on that I noticed. Aside from all the wasps and flies and everything else that came to this, look at all the bits of wax that are scattered all over the surface there. It looked like in the first sequence that those were being carried away. So I thought I would come back, get some macro video and macro stills and see if I could catch wasps or whatever other species of insect might be there hauling away the bits and pieces of wax. Guess what? Nothing was taking the wax away. They're just getting a hold of the bits and pieces of wax and getting every little bit of sugar off of it that they can because that's what honey is. It's the carbohydrate. They all need it. They're desperate for it, as you can see here now. And look at this. There could not be more bees on the surface of that comb. Therefore, I have figured out that it takes more than six hours to clean up a single comb of wax made by the bees in order for them to clean it up completely and leave nothing but a comb skeleton behind. And of course, they're getting under it, on top of it, on the sides, the edges. And who leads the charge here at a feeding station like this? The honeybees definitely dominate. We have lots of species of wasps. As if you keep watching this, you're going to see the individual species that I found here, because you can see my camera there cutting in on the left side. Because while the time lapse sequences are being recorded, I'm also getting some full frame video and stills but I'm going to show the video later and we're going to see what's here and it is surprising. Now sometimes you'll see a dead wasp, a dying bumblebee, things like that laying around next to it. Who is stinging them and why are there no dead honeybees? So the problem there is often the wasps fight each other. Sometimes the honeybees are stinging them to death and just leaving them there. So it's very interesting. The other thing you might see is on that white surface there are little tiny specks that might look like Varroa destructor mites, and there aren't any. So this is all propolis, wax, cap wax, and some crystallized honey was in these frames. This comes from my beehive. So it was surplus honey that we pulled off in the spring that was left over from winter and put into storage to feed back during periods of dearth. But instead, I decided to do this test and put it out. Now, could this possibly bring all the bees in close proximity to one another and pass on potential pathogens and potentially transfer diseases to other colonies within your apiary? And yes, that's true, it could. So you do run a risk when you have feeding stations, open stations like this, but what I find is it draws the bees' attention, gets those foragers away from the apiary, and uh, reduces the stress on those landing boards of bees that would otherwise be robbing them out. So look what's left here, just the skeleton, just the basic honeycomb. And another question gets answered, answered, 
Another question gets answered by this video, and that is, how do I know when I look in a hive and they don't have any food or resources left, how do I know whether it's been robbed or if the bees just consumed it themselves and there wasn't enough coming in to sustain the colony? Well, if you look at the edges of the cells of the comb and the bits and pieces of wax cast all over the place, those are telltale signs of robbing. They chew them off. They rip everything apart. They're not concerned in preserving the wax, and they're not planning to rebuild it later, as those in the colony would be if they were just consuming the resources and then going back to restore the cells and refill them, you would not see jagged edges on the leading edges of those hexagonal cells, which are made from beeswax. So again, look here as things filter out. The honeybees have gone. For the most part, our wasps now left and flies everywhere. And again, as I said before, I'm going to give you a close-up look of all that uh, with the camera here. And they even ate through the foundation. Look at that. So the entire period of this segment that you have just watched was from 11 in the morning until 6.30 at night. So it doesn't happen fast. If you were able to, and this is with full access to the comb, so if you're able to walk through your apiary and determine that your colony is being robbed by wasps or bees or a combination of both, because once the floodgates are open, there's a frenzy and they all go after the honeycomb inside. So you actually have several hours to get an entrance reducer on there, some kind of robbing screen if you want to, but you do have an opportunity to intervene. And look at the wax moving around there. That's because there's so many wasps underneath of it, top left there. The other thing is there's some very interesting species in among the bees, and we're going to take a close-up look at those coming right up here. So now here we are. Look at this bumblebee, right? That's not a bumblebee at all. That is a bumblebee mimic. That's a fly. Look at the proboscis on that thing. So all these species go after honey for sure. And look at the jagged edges of the comb. Signs of robbing, but that right there is also sometimes referred to as a bee wolf. It uh, is a robber fly. They come in different shapes and sizes, and this is a big fat one. It could grab a bee and kill it, or other insects. They uh, don't suck the blood of other insects. They digest and suck it out. So here we are close up, and these are close ups that were taken during the time lapse sequences that you saw earlier on. I wanted you to see how the bees really go about what they're doing and what robbed out comb looks like. And one of the reasons I really enjoy doing this too is because I want to see what other species are around. So if you're an entomologist or an amateur entomologist and you just like to identify different insect species, specifically wasps here, look at the one here on the right. Long mandibles, distinctive waspy markings, and a different species on the left there. So when you're putting out honey in particular, everything's gonna to come to it. Even the meat eaters still go for the sweets. And there are really tiny wasps here too, tiny bees as well. So much more than just the honey bee, and it's just a great chance to see what's in your area. Guess what did not show up during these sequences? There are no bald-faced hornets. Also, not a single European hornet showed up. Front and center there is a paper wasp. Those are the ones that I've been culturing around the area here and gluing in their little nests to make sure that they're protected and that their numbers increase. Fantastic pest control. Also in the background there, for a moment, you saw that emerald green little wasp there. we get a close-up of that later. But you really get to see what's going on around where you live. Look at the flies, look at the wasps, look at the tiny bees. Ants, of course, come scooting in through there. But without a doubt, the most dominant species at any feeding station like this is going to be the honeybees. And we're going to answer some other questions too today through observation. We know that the bees locate a source and they find something that they want, they take it back to the hive, and they meet with taste tester bees to decide whether or not it's something that they want in the hive, and top of that list would be honey. And that's because honey comes through the door 
ready to store. The cherry gets passed from crop to crop, B to B. So they do process it, they do add their enzymes. Here is a dying bumblebee. You can tell by its tongue. Also look at his feet. See the little yellow things that are attached to the toes. This bumble has been on milkweed plants because that's milkweed pollen, if you can believe it or not. And there's another piece of it stuck right on the end of its tongue. But uh, some insects do not get along at the uh, robbing station like this. And so this bee has been stung enough and it's going to die. Look at that. Do you think that's a bee? That's actually another fly. Look at the proboscis there. Telltale sign. The eyes are another giveaway. And those appendages right on the face also tell you that that's a fly. Look at this jeweled wasp. Look at the mandibles on it too. Now they're just all after sugar. This thing is so tiny. Maybe a quarter inch in length. And they roll around, they get a hold of a piece of cast off beeswax here and they just want to lick every little bit of honey that's left on that and get it off of there. Now what's that? A bee or a fly? That's a bumblebee. Look at the number of wings it has. Also, look at the proboscis coming out. You'll see a long feathery tongue coming out and the bumblebees have this characteristic behavior of sticking their feet up in the air to push people away from it. This really shows you a close up, shoulder to shoulder, of the bees trying to get as much honey out of there and take it back to their own colony as they can. And it shows you that they really don't care what else is around because frankly, once they get a taste of honey, they'll do anything to get more of it. That's why your chances to stop robbing in your hive really occur in providing an entrance reducer for your weaker colonies, putting in a hive gate or something else that causes the scouts to go through a conduit and engage your guard bees so that smaller colonies can protect the resources that they have because once scout bees get in, get a taste of that honey and get it back to their home colony, they come back in numbers significant enough to overwhelm the guard bees. So a smaller entrance is your line of defense. And then of course it may be a weak colony that's going to die out anyway, and we don't want to rob that. We want to inspect that colony, take it apart, and see what the resources are and what the cause of their decline was. Because this, notice, my camera is just inches away from them. None of the wasps, none of the bees, the flies, anything else cares that I'm here because they're absolutely crazed in their desperate attempts to get more honey resources back to the hive. Big old chunk here is going to fall over. None of them care about that. They're covering every inch of it. The other thing is you can see what other bees are around. When there are robber bees, or if you've got them at a feeding station like this, and you want to know what colony they're coming out of and going back to, Get a good handful of powdered sugar, throw it right on top of the pile of bees there, and as they leave, you can go back to your apiary. I have two apiary sites near this feeding station, and you can see where the white powdered bees are returning to the hive, and you know who's benefiting from the robbing. The other thing we want to know is, as they navigate and find a place where there's a resource, they go back to the hive and they communicate that with their waggle dance. If you want to know more about waggle dancing, just Google that, and I'm sure you'll find lots of videos on it. They navigate in reference to the position of the sun. But what happens if the sun's not visible? What happens if you have a heavily overcast day? Are the bees able to travel up to several miles as they normally would on a nice sunny day when they can use that sun's position as a means of communicating where the resources are or when the clouds come in and the rain starts to fall and the sun's not visible do they just stay in the hive or hunker down on location well I'm also going to answer that in this video too because near the end rainstorms come in I followed up on these bees again today so once they know that there is a resource and once they've memorized the landscape, the topography and the landmarks, trees, bushes, buildings, things like that, you'll find out that bees, even when it's raining, will depart the hive, follow landmarks in the absence of the sun's rays and still locate a resource spot and fly back during rain. So bees are smart. Bees have they are the biggest brained insects 
they problem solve. So when we say bees, we include honeybees, bumblebees, every kind of bee. Honeybees are very good at remembering locations, passing on that information, and bringing other bees with them. So again, we're just seeing how everything's all mixed up here. They work it from the edges. The other thing is when they're robbing a frame inside a hive, they don't spread out all over it. They line up in groups and they move in groups across the face of the frame, chewing away the cappings and getting all the honey out in a pretty methodical way. And of course the open cells, the newest nectar, that's what they remove first. And what bees go for is whatever has the highest sugar content. Because again, as I said in the beginning, that's what they can bring back to the colony and they can use that just the way it comes through the door. It's good as a carbohydrate because guess what else happened recently? Not only is it raining, the temperatures have dropped. It's in the low 60s today. And with the rain and the wet and everything else, uh, we're kind of in a mini dearth here and different parts of the country have different dearth periods. But uh, you'll see a lot of people showing how to put out bucket feeders and things like that to feed their bees. But I wanted to find out how long it would take, of course, to consume comb that's just presented open, unprotected. And as we've already said, it takes several hours, so you do have time to check your colonies. And once they're robbed, it's not a foregone conclusion. You can still defend some of those resources if you catch it early. When is prime robbing time? Well, the wasps and hornets start to get in there because they fly colder. They fly earlier in the morning and they try to take advantage of the colony when it's still cold. And they can get through the door early, but they really don't show up in the numbers necessary here in this part of Pennsylvania to really decimate a hive. The worst challenge for honeybees when it comes to defending resources would be the scouts and colonies of other honeybees. So we have wasps, honeybees, all side by side because at this resource this is not a resident colony of course this is just a feeding station and once they memorize the location of this feeding station they scope it out every day so it is on their shopping list and they go out there and the scouts check it out if they find something it is only a few moments that go by before hundreds and then thousands of honeybees are there so by numbers alone the honeybees outcompete the native species that are here when it comes to resources that are presented in the open like this. And you can actually lure a honeybee right off of a flower. So for example, if there's a honeybee sitting on a flower and it's getting nectar and pollen from the flower, which is what they're doing, and that's how they get their normal resources to make their honey, you can take a pipette with actual honey in it and you can lure that worker honeybee right off of the flower and onto the pipette. So that's how much they desire ready-made honey they'll leave what they're pollinating and they'll attach themselves and substitute the honey of course because that has the highest sugar content much more than what they're going to find in the nectar of a plant and then they'll move to that so this is an unbeatable lure for honeybees it's also why for example as they did today they will fly out during a storm So if you know the different species of wasps that you're seeing here, please, in the comment section down below, write the timestamp of where you saw the wasp, its position, center, you know, 1 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and so on, and what you think the species is. Also what you think they can do. Here's that paper wasp again. Look at their amazing eyes when you see them up close. They're not detrimental to the honeybees when they're out foraging. They don't feed on honeybees. But the wasps and the bees, of course, have different diets, unless it comes down to sugar syrup. They all go after sugars because they all need it. Now, when they're reproducing and developing their young, wasps and hornets, of course, need to eat meat. They use animal protein to feed their developing larvae. And uh, the honeybees, of course, get their protein from the pollen of the plants that they're getting nectar from. So this gives us a really good close look at their tongues, their mandibles. Here's a yellow jacket, distinctive dots there on her abdomen, nice and stout. But see how she gave way to the paper wasps. And that's why I culture the paper wasps where I am. It cuts down, I believe, over the years on the numbers of yellow jackets that are near my apiary. 
And since the paper wasps don't impact my honeybees, I'd rather have them around and displace the yellow jackets with that species. And this just gives you a close up of the bees dipping their tongues in there. Notice that when they're drinking sugar syrup, one to one for example, their tongues don't extend much. They actually suck it right up with their mouth parts, with their proboscis. And uh, when it's a thick liquid like honey, now they extend their tongues all the way out and they lap it in because it's too viscous for them to just suck it through their mandible parts, their proboscis. Flies there again. If you're into flies, you'll see every fly species will show up as well. So you can start classifying those, getting your pictures, bottle fly up there at the top. Usually you'll find those on carrion, helping to decompose dead animals. So you might be thinking, doesn't that contaminate the honey? Well, the honey's antibacterial. And uh, the diseases that they might carry on their feet would be greatly reduced if not eliminated once the bees process the honey and get it into there. It's antibacterial. Also we see different lines of honeybees here. To the left there you see that smooth abdomen. Some of these bees look like they might be Russians. Also keep in mind that older bees sometimes have the hairs rubbed off of their bodies, off of their abdomens, and they can appear darker than they otherwise would be. Here's another close-up of that paper wasp. These are very passive, by the way. When I walk in and uh, stand right under the paper wasp nest, they don't pay any attention to me. And where the yellow jackets, of course, would launch a defense right away. Also, these little barbs on their legs there are used to collect caterpillars and things like that that they feed on and hold them while they carry them back to the nest. Again, they gave way to this honeybee worker here. So the honeybees are king of the feeding station, always. Now, if this was a dead out colony of bees and you did not determine the reason for the dead out loss of a queen and so on, if you think there's any chance that there was brood disease or something like that in the colony, you definitely want to get rid of the honey as well. You don't want to recycle that back to the bees. Now, here we are, rainy day this morning, barely hitting 60 degrees. And what did the bees do? The skies are completely overcast. And the bees flew out to the same location and I put another piece of chunk honey out there for them to see if the bees would fly through the rain to get to it, see if they could navigate without the sun, and see if they could still collect the honey and get it back to their hive in this period of rain and a lack of nectar. And sure enough, here they are, shoulder to shoulder. But again, remember that they already knew that it was here. So I think that when the sun is not visible, they can get themselves back to places that they have visited before. I think their foraging is reduced that they would otherwise do when they're looking for new resources and the sun is not shining. I think it's much more challenging for them. But this demonstrates that the bees actually do navigate by things that they recognize when it comes to buildings, plants, trees, they navigate nearby and they certainly can find the resources that they've found before, even on rainy overcast days. Fewer bees, fewer bees in the air, but they do find it. And then you'll go back to your landing boards and see them landing in the rain. So once again, they'll just do anything to get the resources into the hives. are old some are young you can see that they do have the fur rubbed off of their thorax there and their abdomen on some of these darker bees so who knows where they're coming from someone asked me recently if bees pay attention to lightning or if it bothers them 
I've seen no evidence that they respond to lightning discharge. But I am going to talk about that on Friday. And before I got out here with my camera, it was raining really heavy. I was hoping to get that on camera, but of course it lightened up and just went to sprinkling. So there you go. I hope you learned something today and at least got a close look at the bees and maybe gave you some information about how long it takes bees to rob a hive. Many, many hours. Even if they all got through the door without an entrance reducer. Also, all bees are not always what they seem. This bumblebee mimic was a surprise to me. Pretty treacherous little bug eaters here. Thanks for watching. Hope you have a great beekeeping day.